Oh, I like that. This yeah. one, I think that one's stronger than this. Yeah. I think this is more give. This is a firmer Yeah. Oh. And there's something, maybe yeah. there's really something just because nice it's a little stuffy and boy like thing, but yet it's probably yeah. zipper on the back. I don't like okay, yeah. so about um, You know, somebody yeah. thought about them because they're right. yeah. um, yeah. yeah. These are, I mean, I made this. Oh, yeah. Well, being the YouTube yeah. 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 This is what my husband yeah. uses. Um, okay, this right. is a necklace. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm also taking a necklace. Yeah, yeah. coffee. Yeah, yeah. 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 coffee. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this is cool. I'll, I'll take this for my back of my neck. Yeah, right now. I wish I could come up here and just borrow a couple of these Like using the thing for Well, yeah, yeah, I use the mail skin. Yeah, I, use a I think I listened to Kindy at another you know, sensory thing. So they posted the Kindy Mental Health but then I used to talk about some of the sensory. She didn't bring the example, so I was like, 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 no, she talked about the example, but we need the example. You do, you need the apartment, too. And hauling it all around. That's why I didn't bring away the blanket. I just can't bring the blanket. Where do you find these? You go to MC Sports. They're on waste terms, they're called. There's the back. Sometimes you can get them at the dollar store. Um, yeah, when you get them at the dollar store, they don't last okay. very long, but they're good for trying. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. You know what? No, I have a bunch of weight in it. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. They yeah. They yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, we have some of those in there. Those are cool. Kids love them, but they like to pop them, too. Yeah. I'm trying to take you can stick your finger inside of them. That was right. Yeah. 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 Like the idea you mentioned something as far as older kids in the ball uh -huh. that they mess with it too much. They make all kinds of stuff. I don't know if you could put a piece of wood diameter of the ball, stretch fabric over it with the ball okay. underneath the fabric, and then somehow secure the fabric even with a staple gun to the you know, side. You are a genius because they market I something like that. And it, I saw it online as I was searching, and it's like $170 and, uh, you know, or something, and I thought. Yeah. We need someone to make those. You want to make those? <laughs> <laughs> I paid all kinds of stuff on that. More than that. More than the transport. It's like stuff. It's got swings and a lot of armor and stuff like that. One of the best and simplest things has been some stretchy micro fabric plastic and four corners with ropes on the ceiling. Oh, I wish I would have. That's a fabulous idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, talk to Stacy and Sword Books in the ceiling. Yeah. That is a great So you've got a sensory room, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've had to. Very cool. We kind of took examples from ROT and then started making stuff. Did you? Yeah. Well, good for you. I Thank you. Places I wanted to be. Well, my handle's not going to give you a ton of Guys are, you could set up your computer, whatever.
I'm so sorry. I did not get a wait to get that person or um, they want to hear their retired from Rockford Schools, worked there for 20 years, and um, this is my actually 31st year as a school psychologist. I, after I retired, Comstock Park needed a two-day-a-week psychologist, so I went. So there, I'm working there now. My husband, Michael Newell, he's a school hey. social worker in Rockford, been there for 20 17 years in Rockford and three Byron Center before that. So yeah. between us, we have a half century of experience. <laughs> <laughs> and we have four children. So we've been through it. Our children are grown. Our youngest is um, 16. So 
we have seen everything. I think it's working. Anybody got any teachers in here? Any educators? Yeah. You know, working in schools, you see everybody. And we get called in when you're the toughest. So we we're pretty used to that. Um, this approach, this one, two, three magic, is a pretty simple approach. It works for most kids. There are some that we need to do some adjustments with and um, make some other suggestions, but it works pretty well. So I think you'll find that. Yeah. Does it work for teenagers? Actually, you know what? It, it, it's a variation. You can't put them in timeout, which is one of the things that, but when I, I started it, well, I'll tell you a story. Um, I had my one, my one son was six and my other son was three and they were sitting at the, at the bar at the school. And I was at the bar bar. <laughs> no. And um, my youngest said, asked me if he could have something. And I said, no. And my six-year-old leaned over to him and said, is this bag long enough? She'll give them. <laughs> That's what he said. And I heard him say it. He was listening. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I that bad? You know. So then it was like, I got to find a new approach because obviously what I'm doing isn't working. So that's how I got into the one to three magic. That and we had started it, just started at school back then. So, and in Comstock Park where I work, they use it all the time. So it's nice to use it at home too because then the kids are used to it and they're getting it at school too. So there's a lot of practice too. So that works nicely. But yeah, so that was my first when I knew I needed something because my son had my number at six years old. He knew if you beg long enough, you get what you wanted. So this is this works nicely for begging. So I started this end, and um, it worked. It was not not easy to begin with with the old. They bucked for a little while. Yeah. Year old, he, but a couple weeks before he bucked. But yeah, I don't even know if it was that long. Yeah. It was like you know he was a good kid in general, but he was very very active. Right. So. He couldn't catch a break, though. He was a social worker. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, right? That's what you say all the time. You can let it all talk to me, yeah. So I know, I know. People tell me that. So anyway, yeah, but you know, when you have that, you're under a lot of pressure when you're out in public because people <laughs> expect that your kids are going to be perfect. And what kid is perfect? Yeah, so I've had many times I've been in Europe and, and uh, it didn't work so well. I've had to, had to vary a little bit. But anyway, so... What I'm going to do is talk about that. But what I want to start with is, this, these are not in the right order, so I apologize for that. But if you can go to the back page to the 10 gifts we can give our children, I just kind of want to start with that because I think it's important that right from the beginning when you have your children, you, you think about these things. And one is a good name. I, I see this all the time working in my profession that uh, parents will say, he's shy, he's really shy. So then the child stands there and, you know, is shy. And, and maybe they are, you have a temperament of that, but we don't want to give them those names. So you be careful what labels we give our kids. It's really important if you want to give them labels, think of some positive things to give them, some positive labels. Um, a good example was my daughter. I remember I tried this with her because she was um, a really fast runner. And so I said, I think you could be in track. I remember saying that to her once. Just once, probably. But anyway, maybe a few years later, she goes, Mom, I think I want to be in track because I think I'm a really fast runner. And I thought, that just goes to show that what we say, they do internalize. So we have to be careful what we're saying. So that was the thing with a good name. I don't mean Dixie, you know, they could have done better. But, but I mean, just what labels do we give our kids? A listening ear, my kids, one of them. One of them was very good at saying, Mom, you're not listening to me. And he was right. I wasn't. So I had to stop. You have to get down at their level so you can see in their eyes and listen. That's really important, and it validates them. I think it's really important now, too, especially with uh, texting and the computer and everything. We're doing this while we're talking to them. I, am, I understand that we can hear while we are doing something else, but they don't really perceive it that way. Yeah. And they, some of them will call you on it. Some of them will just walk away and stop talking to you. So we have to really listen. Um, allow them to make decisions. And, you know, it's, it's got to be something you can live with. So if they want, if you're going to have snacks at, in the, at bedtime, you got, you know, an apple or a banana or something you can live with, but let them have some decision-making skills in it so that they can feel as they become an adult that they are able to make decisions on their own. They don't need to call mom and dad all the time and ask what they should do with their life. So that's another thing. Um, give them permission for their feelings. And I think I gave some examples here, like this is for teenagers, but puppy love is real love to the puppies. This is, <laughs> you know, it's like, so we don't want to say, oh, it's not real. It's not real love. No, to them it is. And so you want to validate how they're feeling. Or if they say, I hate my sister, I hate her, 
or I hate you. It's like, you sound very angry, you sound frustrated. Give them those words, because those are the words they're really feeling. It's not really that they hate you, it's that they're feeling frustrated. So give them those words. That's what we want to do is validate you sound like you're angry. You know? um, and then provide rules. And that's where one to do magic comes in, because kids, I see this at school, if they, if they have chaos at home, they bring the chaos to school. Their life is chaos. They just, they need rules, they need structure, they need limits. And it's so important that we provide that for them. So when you start at home, we need to carry it on in school. So I say it to teachers all the time, you have to provide structure. They have to have that. So, and, and one, two, three magic is a very simple rule following procedure. So it's important when you, when you think about it, it's like, oh, this seems really demanding, but they need it. They need, they need that structure. Do you want to say anything about that? Because that's no, no, we just agree that it, yeah. it's they not not just need it, but they crave it really. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, they, they probably won't go up to you and beg for it. <laughs> <laughs> just like teenagers at your house. I mean, no rules, don't do what they want, but in the end, it doesn't serve them too well. Mm -hmm. And number six, something. Okay, so give them hugs. Hands are for hugging, not hitting. Um, and I I say this to kids at, at school all the time. I mean, you you can't do it. That's not the way we problem solve. We, we have to figure out other ways. I understand you want to. I understand you feel like doing it, but you cannot do it. And they usually are pretty good about that. It doesn't mean it stops the hitting right away, but at least they've heard it and it's, it's reinforced. Um, let them laugh and play. They are children, not little adults, um, which we sometimes forget. I mean, they're five, six, seven years old, and play is their job at that age, really. I mean. And even in school, when they're very young, the play has a purpose. It's not just goofing around. So yeah, they, they learn how to negotiate, how to share, how to compromise. You know, there's so many things that are learned through play. I'm sure some of you know that already. Yeah, and some of them uh, learn quicker than others. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. They do learn. I give them permission for mistakes. And uh, the best way that I can tell you that I do that is um, just to tell them, that I had a student in my office just yesterday. And I said, it's okay to make mistakes. I'm 52 years old and I make mistakes every day. I said, it's, I, I made three already today. And I'll just give them a number. I said, so it's okay. We're just working on this together. Uh, you, you're going to make mistakes. It's never going to go away. So it usually relaxes them a little bit. Like, okay, he's, he screws up too. So they, they, they take that pretty well. And I do think we parents are hard on ourselves and we don't like to make mistakes. And so we don't show that to our kids, and if we don't, then they expect that they have to be the same way. So we need to keep that in mind that we don't need to be so hard on ourselves. Everybody makes mistakes, and we need to let our kids see that. Truth. They do handle truth a lot better than we think they do. They, they actually handle it a lot better than we do sometimes. Uh, the classic example is when you're taking them for a shot. And she made me take all the kids to the shots. <laughs> so, um, I, yep, it's going to sting a little bit, but it's okay. It's, it's going to make it's going to make it feel better in the end. Or, you know, you won't get the um, you won't get that cold, or you won't get that flu. Or I should I should I guess I shouldn't say you won't. <laughs> it will help you probably not get that flu. So I, I do tell them things like that. Or yeah, I know it's not all that much fun, but you got to do it. It's just one of those things. Because if I tell them it's not going to hurt, they're never going to believe me again. So. And then the last one is a freedom. Allow them to be who they are. We have, um, of all our kids, the one who stands out is the one that beats the, or marches to the beat of his own drummer is 20 now. And um, he does march to the beat of his own drummer. He says things, and he has said things since he was really little. At first I thought, that's kind of weird. <laughs> but then I agree, he's really a cool adult. I mean, he's really, I mean, they all are, but I like to think they all are. But uh, he just, he really thinks outside the box. When he was a little boy, like kindergarten, he used to go outside and dig holes. <laughs> not because he really got into digging that much, because manual labor is not really his thing. <laughs> <laughs> but he thought the whole time. Yeah, he's he's a big, deep thinker, and that's, that's a double-edged sword sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, um, is he going into archaeology? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and nothing that would really actually, surprise me with that. Actually, kind of funny story. My friend's son did the same thing, and they, they had this issue of, like, you didn't do it. You did it. No, we just, we just knew when, when he, he did it, he just do. needed that time alone. And he doesn't dig anymore, but I'm sure he did. Now, now he's a big, big into music, so he'll go listen to music or he'll play his guitar. And that all serves the same purpose for him. So I think that wraps up that list. Okay.
So um, what I'm going to do is this one, two, three magic is uh, there's a video that goes with it. It's kind of dated. I think it's from. The it's about 30 years old. Yeah. And really, almost yeah, everything so is applicable. Yeah. People are wearing their pants up to here. <laughs> <laughs> you know those days. Yeah. So it's a little dated. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's the, the, the message is good, and I'm starting it just on um, the part two, so we missed a bit in the in the in the beginning. But one thing he says is that um, one of the biggest problems that occurs is we have this um, little adult assumption about children, and we think that they should be thinking like adults think. So we think we can reason with them. And we can explain to them, and they're going to get it. And it's like, okay, and they won't do it again because what we say makes sense. Kids aren't that way. They don't reason like we reason. They're developmentally not ready for that. And so we have this is an approach that takes out all of that little adult assumption. And it, it, it's training. It's very simple. There's not a lot of talk. The big thing is, um, in fact, he says no talk when you're doing that. You know, you, you, if a child does something wrong, you give them a warning. And then no talk after that other than counting. And then the other thing is it takes the emotion out because when we start, if a child does something, you know, inappropriate or whatever, and we start counting, and then we go, you better stop now, you know, and you start talking, then you're losing that message of what you're trying to get across is shaping that behavior. And that's what we're trying to do is shape the behavior. So you'll see it. He'll show some examples that you'll see, and then we'll talk about it after. Okay. And there's so, a lot of similarities between a three-year-old and a 16-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, how do I get this? Okay, so I'll play. That should make it play. Why is it not playing? I can play. There you go. Oh, did I go that time? It just okay. lit up. Yep. All right, now I want to skip. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Sorry. I've talked to Hunt. Good parenting and good teaching begin with straight thinking. There are two things that we have to get straight. The first is this. When you have a problem with a child, it, most of us, I know it's true of my wife, too big... Now you know what to think, and perhaps more important, what not to think about kids and about parenting. Your children are going to be grown up and out of the house sooner than you think. You want your time with them to be fulfilling and enjoyable today. That means having fun with your kids, praising them, and listening to them. It also means managing kids' difficult behavior effectively. Dr. Phelan now explains how to accomplish that, step by step. It works, and it's easier than you think. Okay, we said before we're going to talk about how do you get the kids to listen. So let's get down to the brass tacks here and talk about how do you get the kids to listen. What I'm going to talk about first is what we call the one, two, three. Okay, this is our just basic counting procedure, and let me tell you two things about it. One, what are you going to count? You're going to count stop behavior. Minor obnoxious behavior is countable. Arguing, yelling, whining, fighting, teasing, screaming, sibling rivalry, all that kind of stuff you're going to count. Second thing I want to tell you before I get into it is if you're not familiar with uh, the 1, 2, 3, I know some of you are. You may be back here for a refresher course. If you're not familiar with the 1, 2, 3, when you first hear about it, you're going to be skeptical. Okay? Uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to believe it. Some people say, eh, it's too simple. Some people say, no, it's not going to work with my kid. And some people come up to me and they say, it's not going to work with my kid. My kid is a wild man. <laughs> Actually, I sort of enjoy it when they say this because I look back at them and I say, well, I'll tell you something. My kid was a wild man, too. And if you want to have a wild man contest, my kid will have yours for lunch. <laughs> and it worked with mine, so why don't you try it? You know, People go home, they try it, they say, I can't believe it, it worked like magic. That's where we got the uh, title, even though there's no claim to magic. At all, but if you feel a little skeptical, don't worry about it. Uh, go home, try it, uh, see what happens. All right, let's imagine that you have a four-year-old. Some of you do not have to imagine that you have a four-year-old. <laughs> How many four-year-olds do we have represented in this group? Okay, well, that's a lot of four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. If I had a four-year-old at my age, I would be dead in three days. <laughs> so I give you credit for having a four-year-old. You got a four-year-old. This kid, six o'clock at night total nuclear holocaust on your kitchen floor. He is enraged because you, in your hardness of heart, 
would not give him a bag of Fritos right before dinner. Kid has thrown him down, himself down on the floor. He's banging his head. He's biting his arm. He's kicking your new kitchen cabinets. He's screaming bloody murder. You can hear it all the way down the block. And you're at a loss for what to do. You think, what should I do? What should I do? Pediatrician told you to ignore it. You say to yourself, I don't think I could stand that. <laughs> your mother told you to put a cold washcloth on his face. <laughs> I, I, I think that's an old Italian remedy or something. And your husband told you to beat the hell out of him. <laughs> None of these are acceptable alternatives. Instead, what you do is you hold up one finger, you look down at the little devil, and you say, that's one. He doesn't care. He's out of his mind with rage. He, can, <laughs> he keeps screaming, yelling, banging. Temper tantrum continues full force. Five seconds go by. You hold up two fingers. You say, that's two. That's all you say. Same lousy reaction. Five more seconds go by, you hold up three fingers, you say, that's three, take five. Now, what does all this mean? It means that the child had two warnings to shape up. Those are the first two counts. And in this instance, he blew it. He did not shape up. So at three, there's a consequence. Rest period, timeout, timeout alternatives. We'll talk about those later. So the child goes to timeout. Some of you are wondering, how do I get him there? <laughs> And when he comes back from timeout, and you won't believe this, when he comes back from timeout, no talking, no emotion, no lectures, no apologies, no discussions, no nothing, unless it's absolutely necessary, and it usually is not. You do not say to the kid, for example, now are you going to be a good boy? <laughs> do you realize what you've been doing to your mother all afternoon? Why do we have to go through this all the time? I'm so sick and tired of this, I could scream. Your sister never behaves this way. Your father's coming home in a half an hour. Did God put your honor to drive me crazy or what? <laughs> Tempting as that may be, you don't say anything at all. Kid's good, you enjoy it. Kid acts up again, you say, that's one. That's the one, two, three. That's the simple part. What's going to happen in a relatively short period of time is you'll start getting a good response at one or two. And I will promise you right now, the first time you stop a fight between two of your kids across 15 feet of family room, and all you got to do is say that's one or that's two, and you don't have to get up and yell or scream or do something else you're going to be sorry for later. First time you do that, you're going to feel real good. Some people say, my kid always takes me to two. Don't you think he's manipulating me? And my answer is, no, I don't think the kid's manipulating you. I was taking you to two. Why? Because what used to drive me crazy was 42. <laughs> I'll give him the two, because the three is going to get the X. Some people say, what if the kid does something so bad, I don't want to give him three chances to do it? It's a good question. For example, if your kid hits you, your kids can't hit you. If your kid hits you, you're not going to say, that's one. <laughs> That'd be pretty silly. You say, that's three, take five, add 15 more for the seriousness of the offense. Kid goes to school. He's seven years old. He learns a bad word. He doesn't know what it means, but he wants to try it out on you. That night, you say to him, he's on the couch, and please turn off TV, get ready for bed. And he says, you blankety blank. And what do you do? That's three, take five, add 15 more for the rotten mouth. And then he's going to go. And when this kid comes back, from timeout, this is an example when an explanation is in order. When this child comes back, you are going to take some time and briefly explain to him what that word means and why he's not going to use it in your house. How long do you take in between counts? Remember? Five seconds. five seconds, that's right. And why five seconds? Because there's a difference between stop and start behavior. Start behavior like homework or going to bed, uh, you know, getting up and out in the morning could take 15 minutes, it could take 45 minutes. It takes a long time. But stop behavior. How long does it take a child to terminate a temper tantrum? One second. How long does it take a boy to stop teasing his sister? One second. We give him five. That's being very generous. But kids are just kids. So you wouldn't say to a little child, five years old, that's one at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's two at 3.30, that's three take five at 7.15 at night. <laughs> they won't remember the sequence. So we have what we call our window of opportunity, and you know, with a six-year-old, you might pick a half hour, and you say, if you do three things within a half hour, I'll count you up to three. If you do one thing, 45 minutes goes by, and then you do something else, uh, uh, you'll go back to one. 
And there's very few kids that get so manipulative that they'll, you know, do one thing, look at their watch, and they'll say, well, 45 minutes is up, I get a free one. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so what's going to happen, basically, is you'll start getting a good response at one or two, if you do it correctly. Now, what I've told you is the simple part of the one, two, three. Let's talk about the hard part, the not easy part. I've had parents come back to me at different times, and they say, you know, Dr. Phelan, we went to your seminar, and we enjoyed it, and uh, uh, we started, you know, using accounting with our kids, uh, and it worked. It worked. We were very surprised. But that was six weeks ago. It's not working anymore. I don't know if it's us, if it's the air in the house, if it's the dog, if it's the kid, whatever it is, not working anymore. We, we need a new discipline system. If I have a chance to talk to these people, which I don't always, if I have a chance to talk to these people, what's the problem? The problem is they are violating those two basic rules 90% of the time, not all the time, 90% of the time they're violating those two basic rules, the no talking, no emotion rules. And I'm going to try and give you an example of how these parents do it. Uh, they think they're doing the one, two, three, but they're really not. Let's go back to the four-year-old on the floor having the royal temper tantrum, kicking, yelling, screaming, and all this. This is how these parents think they're doing the one, two, three. They hold up one finger like this, it's a good start. They look down at the child and they go, that's one. Come on, I'm getting a little sick and tired of this. Keep this up, you're going to wind up in your room. Look at me when I'm talking to you, young man. That's two. One more and you're up there, pal. One more, baby. One more. Read my lips. One more. That's three. Take five. Get out of here. I never want to see you again. What was that? That was a parental temper tantrum. <laughs> and now we've got two tantrums going in the same kitchen. What's wrong with doing it like that? Well, there are several. We've studied this for years. There are several things wrong with doing it like that. Number one, you want to talk to a kid like that? Did you have a, did you have a bad day at work? You, know, you want to talk to a kid like that? I think a translation of what you're saying is, let's fight. I think that's what you're really saying. Number two, what's wrong with doing it like that? How's the kid supposed to find the warnings or the counts? They're buried in all this verbal garbage. The most important part of what you're saying is the one, the two, and the three. But the third thing wrong with that, and I think the worst part of it, is you talk to a child like that, what you are doing on the spot is taking away from that child his or her own responsibility for their own behavior. Because what you're really saying now is you don't have to behave unless I can give you two, three, four, or five good reasons why. And gee whiz, I certainly hope you agree with my reasons. This isn't discipline anymore. There's another word for this. Starts with the letter B. This is called begging. What's the average kid going to do? They're going to take issue with your reasons. Julie doesn't always behave on the first try. Daddy's not coming home in a half an hour. Now you have left the discipline ballpark. You are out on the street arguing with the kid. What's the issue? Is the child behaving or not is the issue. So to do it right, that's one. Button the lip. That's two. Nothing else is said, otherwise it doesn't work. Let's take a look at our famous Twinkie example. This will give you a better feel for how the one, two, three works. And this is a situation that you have been through. I guarantee you it may not have been a Twinkie, but it might have been some other kind of food. And here's the, here's the deal. Uh, it's quarter to six at night. You're in the kitchen making dinner, and uh, you're going to eat in 15 minutes. You have an eight-and-a-half-year-old daughter, and she comes down into the kitchen. She says, can I have a Twinkie? You say, no, dear. She says, why not? You say, because we're eating dinner in 15 minutes. Now, is there anything wrong with this conversation? Not a thing. Perfectly clear. And she asked a question, straightforward question, straightforward answer. What's the problem? The problem is most kids aren't going to drop it. And she looks at you and she says, yeah, but I want one. <laughs> so what are you going to do? We're going to play this scene through three different ways. In scene one, we will have starring for us a parent who believes in the little adult assumption. Kids are little adults, we can talk the whole thing out and everything will be just fine. Then in scenes two and three, you'll see the parent will start using the one, two, three in the beginning, and then in scene three, after the kid's used to it after a while. Okay, but scene one is the parent who believes the kid's a little adult, words and reasons solve the whole thing. Here's how it goes. Can I have a Twinkie? No, dear. Why not? Because we're going to eat in about 15 minutes. Oh, come on, I really want one. I just told you you couldn't have one. I never get anything. What do you mean you never get anything? Are you wearing clothes? Is there a roof over your head? Am I not about to feed you in two seconds? You just got one a half hour ago. Are you your brother? 
Besides, he always finishes his dinner. I promise I'll eat my dinner. Don't give me this promise, promise, promise garbage, Kelsey. Yesterday at 4.30, you had half a sandwich, and then you didn't touch your dinner. Fine, then. I won't eat any dinner. Don't you threaten me, young lady. You will eat what I tell you to eat. Then I'm going to kill myself and then run away from home. Well, fine. Be my guest. I'm sick of this. Well, family peace and tranquility are down the tubes in this house, so the parent gets smart and says, enough of this, enough of this. We're going to start the one, two, three. One, one, two, three. Scene two. The one, two, three, counting in the beginning, the kid's not quite used to it. How's it going to go? Can I have a Twinkie? No, dear. Why not? We're going to eat in about 15 minutes. Oh, come on. I really want one. That's one. I never get anything. That's two. Then I'm going to kill myself, and then I'm going to run away from home. That's three. Take ten. What hits them right between the eyes when you first do it is, number one, you're the boss. Number two, you have a perfect right to impose this discipline on them, even if they don't like it. But notice you're doing it gently. This is the essence of gentle uh, but firm. But what really hits them between the eyes is they soon realize that no longer can they bait you. That's B-A-I-T, as in fishing. Fishing for what? Largemouth bass. <laughs> no longer can they bait you into a stupid, idiotic argument over a stupid Twinkie. Scene three, the one, two, three, after a while, after the child's used to it. Can I have a Twinkie? No, dear. Why not? Because we're going to eat dinner in about 15 minutes. Oh, come on. I want one. That's one. Oh, all right. You don't have to count the all right because it's not so bad. The kid's leaving the scene of the crime. She's just grumbling a little bit. You know, the whole thing is done. If she said, oh, all right, you stupid jerk, that's three, take five, and 15 more for the hot mouth. <laughs> What's good about the one, two, three? One explanation. You're going to save so much breath, you won't believe it. So your teachers tell me, uh, discipline is so much less exhausting, and I have more time for instruction. Parents tell me, discipline is so much less exhausting, I have more time to enjoy my kids. One explanation, and it usually is not necessary. Parents and books on parents, parenting, let me tell you, overestimate dramatically the value and power of explanations to get compliance from kids. When you talk too much, you irritate a child and you distract them from what they're supposed to be doing. But we're all very intellectually oriented. And say, if I just tell them the reason, they'll look at me and say, gee, I never looked at it like that before. And they'll happily go off and comply. It doesn't work like that. Let me give you an example of an explanation, uh, uh, one that's necessary and one that's not. Let's say you got this little seven-year-old boy, and he's in school, and he's taking trampoline, okay? And he loves trampoline. Now, I don't think they do this anymore, but let's just pretend. So this kid comes home, seven-year-old son of yours, and he's so excited about trampoline, he walks in the living room door, whips off his shoes, he attacks the couch. He's jumping up and down, trying to do flips and all this. You come in, it's like, whoa, that's one. He says, what did I do? Well, do we need an explanation? Yes, you've never been through this before. He's never been trampolining on your couch. So you say to him, well, even though you took off your shoes, which I, which I appreciate, uh, I'm afraid you might hurt the couch or hurt yourself if you go doing that. Good explanation. Now, two hours later, same day, same you, same kid, same house, you're in the kitchen talking to this boy's four-year-old younger sister. And while you're talking to the little girl, the seven-year-old boy walks around behind her and for no reason you know of, bam, gives her an elbow in the back. And you say, that's one. He says, what did I do? That's two stupid questions. And you don't say stupid questions. <laughs> well, what are you going to say? You just hit your sister in the back. We have three witnesses. Now you're out on the street arguing. <laughs> so one explanation is absolutely necessary. And with sibling rivalry is one of the things where you rarely need an explanation, even though sometimes kids will tell you, I don't know what I did. And hit their sister in the face. I don't know what I did afterwards. <laughs> Okay, what's good about the one, two, three? No talking, no motion. Now, this is hard for some people. We could take all of us in this room and line us up in a line from the people who can button their lip easily to those who have to bite their lips bloody trying to be quiet. Uh, some people are just natural talkers. I saw a T-shirt not too long ago, and on the T-shirt it said, Help me, I'm talking and I can't stop. <laughs> and I immediately thought about 15 people I could have bought this thing for. <laughs> 
some of you will have a hard time, some not. But a lot of people, once they start using the one, two, three, and you see the power of silence, your silence speaks louder than your words. You say that's one, who's got the ball? They do, if you be quiet. Right? It, works, it works better. Uh, and what also happens is you won't be as tired. You just won't. You get the discipline stuff done without a lot of this excess energy because you're not getting into talk, persuade, argue, yell, hit, stuff, and things like that. Another good thing about the one, two, three is that your authority is not negotiable. Never negotiate your authority when a rule is being enforced. As the years go by, though, what do you want to do? Some people say, you know, this counting sounds kind of like a dictatorship. Guess what? It is. <laughs> When the kids are little, you know, when the kids are five, it, it, sh it should be a dictatorship pretty much at your house, a nice one. But as the kids get older, it's dictatorship to almost democracy. So when the kids are 17 years old and they're about ready to leave or 18, uh, they have more say in the rules and policies that affect them. But when it push comes to shove, who's paying the mortgage? You are, even at 17. Who knows better than they do what's good for them? You do, and you have a right and a duty to impose it on them even if they don't like it. We often forget that. We think that we have to, whatever we do with our kids, they have to smile and happily accept it. Uh, that's not the deal. What's the route from dictatorship to democracy? One route is the family meeting, uh, which we talk about in the more uh, video. You sit everybody down and you discuss the problems you're having living together. Give the kids some experience with negotiating with other family me members, which is a good preparation for marriage. Another thing that's good about the one, two, three is the punishment is short and sweet. Now, if we're using a timeout, you don't have to use timeout. We have timeout alternatives. But if you're using a timeout system, the rule is usually one minute of timeout per year of the kid's life for a timeout or a rest period. Two-year-old gets two, two minutes, five-year-old, five minutes, 10-year-old, 10 minutes. It's not a sacred rule, but it's a general guideline that you can look to. So the punishment is short and sweet. We would um, uh, timeout our kids for fighting. Say, guys, that's three, take five for both of you when they're fighting. Then we'd say, if you fight on the way up, it's 10, because they had to go up the same stairway, and they'd be going like this all the way up. There. <laughs> so they get a 10. They get a 10. They're up there now. Now, let's do a slow motion replay of the rest of this. They're up there for 10 minutes. They calm down. They come back downstairs. Am I going to bring up sibling rivalry? Are you kidding? You think I'm going to bring it up? I want, I want the kids to come out of timeout guilt-free. We start all over. All these people that tell you to talk. You know, there are books that say, you know, when the kid's in timeout, what are they supposed to be doing? With a firm purpose of amendment, the child is reviewing his past actions <laughs> and designing plans which can be implemented in the future to prevent the occurrence of similar behavior. <laughs> when the child comes down, the parent then requests, what is your plan? Look, you know, this, excuse me, I'm the kid. I'm aggravated by that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think that is uh, helpful. Punishment is short and sweet. I saw a family once their kids stole a bike. Now, you can't use the one, two, three on that. Gets one bike, you say, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> but what the parents did is they grounded this child for a year. So when they came in my office, they told me what they had done. I said, guys, you know, no offense, but this is stupid. Uh, you know, who's going who's gonna to implement it? It's going to cause a war. Uh, you need a bigger punishment, but not something like that. I saw a lady once, and um, she got mad at her nine-year-old daughter. I don't know what it was the nine-year-old daughter had done. But this girl collected Cabbage Patch dolls, which were popular at the time. And this mom took one of the girl's Cabbage Patch dolls, you won't believe this, put it in the sink, and set fire to it. Isn't that incredible? Amazing punishment. You want to punish your kids like that? You're going to start a war. One minute per year of your life. We're not going to start any wars. We'll talk about timeout alternatives a little bit later. The other thing about it is when the kids come back from timeout, it's done. They're friendly. Now imagine. You sent your boy up to uh, uh, timeout for something or other. Jamal, time's up. You can come out now. Hey, Dad. Hmm? Look what I found in this book. It's really cool. Let me see here. Wow, what is this? Where's the resentment and anger? It's gone. It's done. We had the discipline. We made our mark. And we move on from there. At this point, you may still be a little skeptical. After all, you're trying to manage kids in the real Okay. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it is. Um, the thing we didn't get into is how do you get your children into timeout? And it um, depends on the child. We had with our children, 
one that we had to carry in. He was, that's our oldest, so he was six when we started it. And he had to actually hold the door while he was in timeout and not talk, not talking. And he kicked the door and he screamed and he carried on and tried to open it. And so that was a rough one, but um, we just didn't interact. We just held the door and he finally gave in. And then you start the timer. So we, I brought this timer because you guys already seen this today. Has anybody shown this to you? No. There's these timers you can buy. I think they're like 25 bucks and they're pretty big. But these, um, if you, I'll start with this. If you're if you're using it for yourself, you can use any kind of timer if you're holding the door because once he's quiet, then you can set the timer. And we we kind of varied this because I felt like five minutes was too long for my kids, so I did less. I did like actually we we put them in timeout. They had to count to sixty. So right. like, they learned how to count. They're all excellent so, counters now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and our first son really what once we got through the holding the door, I think we had to do it twice. Honestly, I, I think it was yeah, only so. twice. And then after that, we were able to set him. We had we had stairway, so he would they, they would sit in the stair on the steps and the stairs, and um, he did fine with that. And then so I say count to sixty. And really, the point with us I found was that I just they just need to be distracted from whatever they did wrong. We're just shaping that behavior so they know it's not tolerated. So he count as fast as he could, and he was out of there. Our second one, he um, would go into timeout, and he was so stubborn that he's like. I'm not Okay, don't come out. <laughs> yeah. and, it's not required. Here, you come but out. you don't talk to him. You know, you know, he's, he's, he's screaming. He's not coming out. That's fine. You know, we just don't respond. And sometimes he'd sit there an hour and not come out when he could have been out in 60 seconds. You know, if he counted. But um, he finally learned that. You know, I'm not hurting them. I'm hurting me. So he quit that and started counting, started count, um, counting and getting out. And then our our third, our daughter, when she would get to three, which was only a couple times. She would, I didn't have to set her a time out. She's like, I know, time out. She had a time out. So it really worked wonderfully for us. It really did. Yep. How long have you been doing this? How old? Still do. I still do. I mean, yeah, really. Um, When the kids were, yeah, I mean. 23 and married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's kind of funny because when they were um, teenagers, I would still count them. But then it's their keys that I take or their um, phone. phone. You know, and and they knew it. They knew that it was going to happen. And because I did get to three once in a while when they were teenagers because they thought, no more time out. What's she going to do? I took the phone. And they and they hate the phone being taken. So that worked like a charm. I mean, I only had to do it once. Jonathan, maybe. And, just, <laughs> and, and if they don't give you the phone, money. then you pick up and call the, call the provider, which <laughs> had to do that before, too. Right. So, uh, would you shut off the texting for this number, and, and then they can pay for it when they decide to get it back? Hope, hopefully, they won't get to that point. But. Yeah. So you talk about bringing you had to carry your six-year-old, but once yeah. your child's older than that, you can't carry it anymore. Okay, if you have a older child, then you can you can dock time, uh, bedtime, you can dock um, TV time, you can dock computer time. You know, there's different things. If they have money, you can take a dollar away. I mean, you know, whatever. Whatever works, whatever's the um, incentive for your. You just have to be sure you can enforce. Time. Yeah, you have to be sure you can enforce it because otherwise it won't be good if you can't enforce it. Yeah, and what I was going to say about the timer too is that so if you have your child sitting on a stair step or on a chair or wherever they sit, once they get used to it, they sit because they just want to get it done and get it over with. So you can set the timer, especially when they're little. And then this just goes, and if you, the red, the, don't watch the red go. We use this a lot in school. Kids love this. I mean, they really watch it and they'll tell you, I so they know, you know, so you don't have to stand there and watch the time. They will let you know when that time's up. So um, you can buy them online as Time Timer, T I M E T I M E R. As apps now that you can Oh, yeah, you can, yeah, you can get it right on your iPad. Good point, yeah. So yeah. you don't have to spend $20. Good point, yeah. I bet they hated that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I forgot about better. that because our teachers put it up on the computer too now, so they can somehow access it on the computer. But these work so well with our even our special needs kids. They really get this. They, they the visuals are huge with special needs kids. So you um, you know they really respond to the time. Or if you if you want them to brush their teeth or get ready for bed or that kind of thing, it takes them forever to do that. You can set this timer and say, okay, when the red is gone, we always use that language. When the red is gone. Because they don't understand clock time, you know. So it's when the red is gone, you need to have your pajamas on. And then if they get them on, you know, you can give them some kind of 
reward a hug or a, a play a game or whatever you want to do. It also you know, takes up like Simon says, yeah. 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 So it's just this works very nicely because then they have a visual and they know how long they have to get that job done. So that works very nicely with the little ones. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when um, one parent is on the ball with the one, two, three? That's a problem, Nancy. Yeah. And the other parent just doesn't get it. Like with our middle son, mm -hmm. I tried to explain to my husband. And I swear, between one and two, there's two minutes. And then between two and three, there's also two and a half, two and three quarters. Oh, dear. Yeah. I'm just sitting there like, really? Um, this he's sabotaging it, and it's yeah. not going to work. It's, it's not going to work. He knows it's not going to The kids know they get, the, they get your number that quickly. I mean, our kids knew that when I said it, I meant it. I don't know about him. <laughs> he didn't count. I usually did the counting. It was usually me, I think, more I than you. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think you did the two and three quarters. I start counting, and they generally. We'll do what I say, otherwise, you know, they, they know they're going to They know, yeah. It's always, how come they listen to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, he's got to, you got to leave him with him more than he has to get, <laughs> like, realize that i got to do something because I might, they're out of control. Or touch your husband. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about starting to use this on him anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, seriously, though, that's, that's not good. You need to be on the same page. If you have a daycare person, they should be doing the same thing. If you, you know, grandpa and grandma, whomever is watching the children, it would be really good if they were using the same approach. So, bedroom is where you shut the door? We did. Yeah. And her bedroom is not a good place. Okay, and you know, if the bedroom's <laughs> not a good place, what he recommends is if you have a tough kid that will trash the room, take out anything that you don't want destroyed before you start this behavior plan. Because they, those kind of kids will trash the room. He also recommends that you don't clean it up because it gives them another chance to trash it again. So leave it like that until you get them trained. So, yeah, and then <coughs> you can clean it up together. I have a question because obviously when they show the video, it's all just nice. And they're yes. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. It really um, does happen, believe it or not. Well, what if, what if your child is having that temper tantrum yeah. and you do the one, two, three, and that kid's still screaming, hitting whatever? Yeah. What are you doing at that point? Well, as a parent. You, are you talking about a, a child you can't pick up and carry out? Correct. Okay. So what you need to do is you need to leave. You okay. you go out of the room and his timeout is right there. So you're out of the room. Just leave. Don't give him any attention. No acknowledgement. Just leave. Okay. I mean, don't you know? Don't, go outside. don't leave. Get in the car the and go somewhere. But, <laughs> what's that? The kid blocks you. He blocks you. And she's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's good. She can How old is she? Her. She's 11. She's strong. Mm -hmm. If that's happening, then you've got to hit her where it hurts. So it's going to be, she, there's something, a phone, I don't know what she has. I mean, what does she like, computer? I mean, you've got to take something away because she's, that's not okay. That's right. not okay. She's right. going to be a bully. She may be a bully. I mean, that's not good. Just to me. Just to yeah. me. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know. Else. You don't no, know. I don't. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you can sting them. You can sting them pretty good. If it's just to you, then that says a lot to me. No, it's just her parents. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that says that. She knows that she's going to win this year. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, she would be doing it to everybody. So she's doing it just you. She knows she's going to win. So you got to find what won't let her win. What's going to hurt enough? I don't mean physically. Don't get no. me wrong. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, what's going to hurt her enough that, it, that it's going to be worth her stopping that? You know, it's usually taking away, that yeah. taking away that mm -hmm. iPad. Mm -hmm. That causes that behavior. Okay. Well, so then now you know I did. Take it away okay. That, that is true. But what I did, okay, I take the phone away, and my son would get really upset and start mouthing off more. And I'd say, that's one, because what's going to happen is it goes for another day, and he knows. So it's right. one day, right now. It's going to be more. So he knows that already. I give him the warning first. So yes. if he's continuing mouth off, you're going to lose it for another day if you don't stop. And sometimes he'd lose it for three days because he didn't stop until he knew. And and honest to God, as soon as like when it'd be that's two days now. He's lost it for two days. I'm sorry. And finally, he'd oh, you make me so mad. He'd walk away. And this is 16, 17. I mean, he was. And that's know, a He point. lost it. I didn't give it back. It was like two days. It's not. So is this a good behavior? Because she has a hard time getting off. We we only let her have the iPad during the weekends. Mm -hmm. Good reason. Mm -hmm. Because she has a hard time getting off of it. So is that a good strategy to use to get off of it then? Because it's like you know it's free, and if they don't get off, then they. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. And but as, then, long, as you know, long as she has a clear time, she's yep. right. You know, yeah. If she doesn't get up, then she loses it the next day. And or you might even let her do ten minutes on the iPad during the week, so you can use that <laughs> to take it away. You know, I mean, you gotta have something. You have to have some leverage. 
Yep. You leave them in there. Leave them in there until they're calm. And then once they're calm, then you start to time. Yeah. Yes. 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 So you don't, so even you don't even start it. No, so don't even start. And you let them know that ahead of time if, they're, if they can comprehend that, if they're old enough to comprehend that. You're going to go a timeout. You can either sit there nicely and where you choose like, for your timeout. As long as it's not in the, you don't want them right there with the family where they're reinforced if they're sitting there and watching everything going on. You want them to not like it, you know. So um, if and you say, if you don't cooperate, I have to hold the door and I'm not going to start a timer until you're calm. So, yeah, I remember my six year old going, oh, another behavior plan. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. He's, a far, he's a pharmacist. He's not, he's not okay, but he was okay. He gives the I think you know it's you can you can it's always good to teach them, but they it's it's a fine line when you're um, reinforcing behavior by giving attention to that behavior. So you have to be so careful not to reinforce that behavior by giving it attention. So that's why we step school people. This is a common problem. I would say. At a different time, you know, when, when everybody's calm and you're not even thinking about that at that time, that's when you bring up, you know, what should you do in a situation that, and just, you know, bring up something like that, I would say. Just where he might not make that connection that it's related to that moment. So, not yet. It's hard because it's like he's four, but he's not. Like, he wouldn't understand a conversation like that. Right. It's hard to know. Well, and that's the thing, you know, that's the thing with love and logic and that kind of thing. It's like, okay, you know, this child doesn't wear a boot, so then. He goes outside in the snow with no boots. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, they don't get it yet. You know, it's so major. So you just don't go there with them. Like, okay. As they get older, yes, then there's nap time. So that's a little okay. conversation. But at four, he, his reasoning skills aren't that high level yet. They're just not there yet, developmentally. So you have to do what's developmentally appropriate. At 16, yeah, you, you, know, you have that 16 and you're dealing back with the <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know about the that the whole the boots thing. I don't know if parents have loved logic first and first. Uh-huh. And I tried that and he would have been about five. Uh-huh. And you know, you just sat there and played and I said, All right, we're ready to go more boots. Well, you can take them with you and put them out of the car, but I'm you you chose to play. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you his three year old sister, man, I say, All right, your mama's ready, we're going, man. That kid's in there and she's putting her boots on. <laughs> they do yeah, the younger ones do observe and like I said with my daughter, she already knew. She knew. She I, and we never had an issue. Girls are, well, I shouldn't say that because there are some tough girls too, but our girls tend to be easier. Okay, he recommends you still time out. So, first he says, if you have a difficult child, don't take them to the grocery store with you if you don't have to. You know, just don't, don't even Especially if your start that strong. power struggle. If you do yeah. have, if you have, if you have to. If you have to take them, and this was, I always, with my kids, when I, when I would go like Meyer, I would go right to the toys and grab something for them to play with, and so they were occupied, and I kept them in the car so I could get my grocery shopping done. And then at the end, if they behaved, and when we got up there, I'd hand it to the clerk, and they didn't care. They would just take it and put it under, you know, that they bothered them at all. Then if they got out of the store without screaming for whatever they were playing with, then they could ride the home and so still the best like, part of going. Yeah. But if they still work through 20 hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but yeah, that's what we did. So, you know, sometimes they would say, I, but I don't want to give it up. You know, they're screaming about not having that toy. It's like, well, sorry, you. I, I took it from them, gave it to the clerk, and we walked out without the pony ride because they didn't do the right thing when we got there. So, so and that shaped very quickly. So that's an example of that. If you do have to do, get to three, then you find a place that you can go to do a timeout and give them the timeout. You still give them the timeout. That's what we recommend. It's, I know it's uncomfortable. And I had somebody even, I remember once I was in wire and uh, my son had crawled underneath the car. And it was like, okay, I'm not even going to, he was in timeout. So he just kind of crawled under the car and just sat there. And um, this man, he was, I don't know how old, probably my age now, but back then, and he came up and he grabbed him out under his arm and pulled him up. And he said, um, he, said he, he made some comment, I can't remember what it was because it really bothered me at the time, but he, he said something about me not being a good parent because my son was 
under the tarp. And, you know, he's laying on that, you know, the, the bottom of the ice and pulled him out of there. And so it was like, oh my gosh, you know, but so that could happen and you have to be prepared for that. People might give you a look or whatever because you know how your kids are. But you could take them. He says if it's too bad, you take them out to the car and do the timeout out in the car and just leave your cart with the, you know, wherever you have to. I mean, you you have to stay in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the time. We do, um, we have a kids that play all in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. So we put them in the bedroom and just be like good playtime. So we do uh, a quarter uh -huh. of the house, arms above the head, how uh, old they are. So our 13 year old was uh, getting time off very much, but just finding that that's not comfortable. <laughs> I wouldn't say so, but. Um, you know, in stores and stuff, they try it, especially my six year old, he's uh, in middle town, he's really rambunctious. And he'll start, you know, kind of be on the edge, teetering, and I'll be like, hmm, I see a corner over there, and I think yeah. that corner looks yeah, like over there. And I've done it before, I've gone over to yeah. Myers, the pharmacy section, sat himself down in the chair, but like, that corner's calling your name, child. Yeah. Yep. People do, they look at you kind of funny, but I'm um, like, you want to say something, you're a smart child. Yeah. Excuse me. What do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. I bet I know where you were. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. um, You're not allowed to do time out. Nope. Yeah. So That's a big problem with this. <laughs> yeah. They want you to distract them, right? They want you to distract them. Or... Except this is also a day of parents. So now it's this hot issue. Don't so want to come. Yeah. And so I don't. I don't because I was raising this with my own mm -hmm. father in law and now I have grandkids. So she is But you're good, you're a good witness. Yeah. Well, okay. So we're still working for him. And I'm doing this one, two, three, you know, one, two, my baby just took my baby to the time out and I'm mm -hmm. the red mm -hmm. dumping it on my hip with the little foot dresser and she's like, how oh, well, what do you do? Okay, so I was screaming at home. That's just yesterday. Yeah. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I have a very difficult time with um, centers that do not do timeouts. I mean, I have gone, honestly, I, they'll call me in to come and consult and help them, and I can't help them because it's chaos, and you have to have structure and control, and when a child's hitting you and you don't do anything about it because you're not allowed, that's just chaos, you know, and so I am totally opposed to that and it's really difficult. The only thing I would say is that um, you'd have to use reward system of some kind to get him to comply and shape that behavior. So you'd have to go the other way and you know they say ignore, distract. It's very hard to these kids hit. If they, you know, the kids will push it as far as they can push it. And if you can't time them out or do some kind of punishment, then it becomes hitting, kicking, you know, handsome constantly. So I know that's probably the parents. Yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah, but did it help because often I just start from home, some of it. There is no consequence oh, anymore. Right. right. That's the thing. Nothing to do with Yeah. Much. Yeah. And that's right. 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 That's exactly right. And, and that's the problem is, and you know, some of the homes are, they just, they don't know how to discipline. And, and so. They come to school undisciplined, and then we're supposed to figure it out, which, you know, which is very difficult. And that's why it's so important that we all work together, you know, and, it, and we can, and, and it works very nicely when we all work together. So, yeah. Yeah. You can talk a lot about different special needs children. Yeah. Um, are you going to have some kind of workshop? Have they had them before yet? And uh, the special needs for or or magic. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, in, in terms of pressure, I've got a couple. Where are you? In Granville. Oh, you're in Granville. Okay. Yeah. Just stand in the middle of the park right now. Yeah. yeah. What age is your child? Eight. Eight. Okay. Eight. okay. okay. And what level of time is your one? And I was just saying, we have some people here today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I would put you in jail. <laughs> that should have given me a perspective as to what my husband's parents would tell me. A joke. You guys should talk about that. You know what? It makes you continue to roll. She came by me, I grabbed her arm, and I said, This is a restaurant. We used to sit in restaurants. Put your ass in that seat. No. Mom kind of looked at me a little ticked off, but I said, You know what? I said, That's embarrassing to me. Having kids up and that's not the only thing I had to do with that child. She moved to She was older. <laughs> Here, huh? <laughs> I thought I lived here, so I just don't oh, you, you live here. <laughs> 